All right, so thank you guys for being here today. Um, we're going to be going over some of the local plants in the Ozarks, and there are quite a number of them that are very useful, edible, medicinal. We're going to be talking on three of those today. But first, uh, my name is Dr. Taylor Goodwin. I'm a naturopathic doctor and uh, recently came over here from Arizona, actually, just in March, so it's been nice to see the color green because that wasn't a big thing in Arizona. Um, they have lots of wonderful plants, but it's nice to get a bit of a change. So, um, I often get asked, what the heck is a naturopathic doctor? Or more accurately, I usually get asked, what's a neuropath? Um, a naturopath is basically a doctor who went through medical school, but we specialized in alternative medicine. So we have a lot of tools in our belt. We do get trained in pharmaceuticals and other things uh, in that nature, but we also get trained in things like uh, hydrotherapy, acupuncture, lifestyle medicine, and herbal medicine, which is what we're going to talk about today. That's been something that's uh, been of interest to me since I was a kid. Um, when I was younger and less mature, my mom would have to say, stop picking and eating other people's plants. Now that I am more mature, my wife tells me that. So... <laughs> Um, today we're going to break up the uh, presentation into three sections, what I usually like to do. Section one, we go over safety because anytime we're talking about plants and using them, we want to make sure that we do so in a safe manner. Um, so that's going to be section one. Section two, we'll talk about our three friends here. Um, in the winter months, we tend to turn towards the evergreens because lots of the other guys are hiding until the next year. Um, but we do have one other one that it's a good time to go ahead and harvest. Um, and then section three, I'll go over some events and I'll just kind of take questions and we'll just shoot the breeze a little bit. So, um, first off, safety. Um, I like to tell a story for this actually. So, when I was in medical school, about uh, a year or two into it, um, I was ready to not be in medical school. And uh, so was my wallet, but that's another thing. Um, and there was an elective, they called it a selective, because it's a lot more expensive, and so the S charges you a lot. But um, where I could go from Arizona into the Rocky Mountains and learn about plants for a week. And so I paid a lot for this vacation. Um, and went with a bunch of other medical school friends into the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. I don't know if you guys have ever been into Colorado, but there's a place called Vail. And I'm pretty sure that when you die, that's where you go. If you've been good, it's gorgeous. Um, the Vail Pass has waterfalls, it has canyons, it has lots of beautiful plants as well. And so we were able to go there and uh, be led by a very able um, clinical herbalist um, and learn hands-on through the week lots of different plants that we've been learning through uh, more traditional learning environment back at SNM. But now you got to have hands-on experience in medicine making. Towards the end of the week, however, we went further up into the mountains than we had gone previously. Um, and we were looking for a particular plant that likes to grow at high altitudes. It's called osha, uh, also known as bear plant. It's one that's pretty important to the Native Americans. It's considered a sacred plant to them. And we went higher into the uh, mountains and we found where the osha had been. And she said, oh dear looks like this one didn't make it or it's been harvested and so this happens sometimes all right all of you shoo shoo um go try to identify let's see i think it was wild arnica and wild violet go and try and identify those welcome Sorry, in I'm late. you're absolutely fine um but so we went off and we were looking for the wild arnica and wild violet and we're like does this look like a heart-shaped leaf or is it more of an arrowhead shaped leaf because that's the difference between the two and we did that for 15 minutes and then eventually we started heading back to where um, our uh, plant guide, our herbalist lady, had found a new stand of OSHA. She called us back over. And on the way over, one of our medical school group said to everyone else that, uh, oh, she's going to tell us something really cool about OSHA and how it looks like another plant. So we make it back over there, and she starts telling us a lot of really fun things about OSHA. Um, she tells us about how it's sacred to the Native Americans. She tells us about how it's also known as bear plant. And there's actually a really fun story I'll divert to go ahead and share for a bit. Um, there was a zoo, actually, with uh, two bears, a mama bear and a papa bear. And mama bear was having some arthritis, bear arthritis, much worse than human arthritis. Um, and the zookeeper had heard about bear plant, and so he dropped some bear plant in just to see what they would do. He heard that they liked bear plant. 
and Papa Bear rushed over to where the OSHA was, picked it up, and he started lathering up with it immediately. And 15 seconds in, he froze. And then he walked over and dropped it in front of Mama Bear, because Papa Bear knows what's up. Mm -hmm. Mama Bear picked it up, lathered up, and enjoyed it, and then ate it down. And the next day, Mama Bear was moving a lot better. And so OSHA is known as bear plant and bear medicine because the bears actually use it that way, and it's actually pretty effective. Um, so we learned a lot of really cool things, and at the end of that, she went over a few other things, but she said, and that's OSHA. And then the, the medical student that had asked the question went ahead and raised their hand and said, how do you tell this apart, though, from poison hemlock? <laughs> and important question, she said, oh yes, thank you for reminding me, you tell it apart by the smell. They actually look extremely alike, and so we've been learning how to make medicine out of the plants and how to harvest them, and this is kind of an important detail, but I tell the story for three reasons. Um, number one, everybody who teaches something, all of them, are human, and when you're learning something where a small mistake can have big consequences, you always want to have more than one source. So we're talking about using plants here today, um, you can talk to other herbalists, you can talk to other naturopaths. Most of them that teach will say the same thing. Try to have more than one source, or at least more than one exposure with one source, one person. So, that'll help you be safe. Number two, um, some plants can be dangerous. Um, poison hemlock, spoiler, it's poisonous. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the way to tell those two apart, there is the smell, there are some other ways you can tell them apart, but um, with a lens and things like that, but those are really similar. Most of them, thankfully, aren't that similar, um, and they have more things to tell them apart than that. But by doing your homework, like we mentioned before, you'll be able to come across those lookalikes when you read or when you learn from people, and they'll be able to steer you clear of that. But whenever you're going for a plant, we want 100% certainty identification, just for the sake of safety. Um, and then the third reason I tell you this story um, is OSHA was sacred to the Native Americans, and it also is extremely good medicine for a number of things. Um, it's good for joints and humans, too. And because of that, it was over-harvested. It actually was almost extinct um, for a period of time, and it has disappeared from some local areas because it was over-harvested. Um, now, when we went up there, after she finished telling us about it, all 30 of us, it had come out of endangered status, but all 30 of us medical students together harvested one root. That was a responsible amount because it was no longer endangered, but we didn't want to push it back that way. So the third tip is not safety for you, but safety for the plants. They actually can become extinct in an area. It's happened. There are two, there's more than two, but two in this area that, can, that are endangered or close enough to it that probably don't harvest. American ginseng, that's one, and echinacea. It's okay if you take a little bit of, you know, a leaf or something like that, but don't, don't go ahead and dig it up or take all the flower heads. That's how it reproduces. Those ones get from a place that's um, growing their own or grow your own. So for those of you who enjoy having the green thumbs, which means here, okay, Arizona, you have to work really hard. Here you stick your thumb outside. It's, ah, it's green. Ah. So um, there are some medicinal plants that are so vigorous that it actually is about that easy. You can take some seeds, you throw it, and then you come back a week later and it's like, ah, my harvest, it's wonderful. Um, so plants that are like that, they tend to be really common. Plantain, one that we have right here, this is Plantago uh, Major, I believe this one is. It's hard to tell with the leaves all dried up there. But uh, broadleaf plantain, that one, when you're harvesting, so we're going over harvesting tips now, the really common ones, Go ahead and harvest up to half of what's there. Um, and if it's on your front doorstep and it's really common, of course, it's you know your land, go for it. Um, if you harvest half, they usually can grow back. Now, if it is uncommon, not endangered, but uncommon, it kind of depends on exactly how uncommon, but the rule of thumb is take one third of everything above ground, leaving the roots alone. You can probably take a few roots and that's all right, um, and then those will be able to replenish and propagate as well. If it is endangered, take nothing but photographs, leave nothing but footprints. Mm -hmm. So that way they can continue to come back up and um, rejoin us again, hopefully. 
A lot of the endangered ones are really good for medicine, so it's like tempting, but the reason they're endangered is because people did overharvest them for medicine. That, or there's some kind of invasive that's pushing them out of their territory. Um, Bromus tectorum has a lot to answer for. But, um, so, um, I guess last safety tips that aren't related to that story. Um, when harvesting, I actually do have a fun story I'll share, and it actually applies to one of our plants today. I was, once again, a medical, stu uh, medical school student early on. I had, um, had experience with pine before because, you know, it's a very exotic plant that no one's ever heard of, pine trees. But somehow I'd come across them. Um, but uh, I decided I wanted some pine needle tea one day. So I went out, and I found a pine tree, and I harvested some pine needles, and I came back, and I made a tea. I let it sit all overnight. Very strong tea. Lots of pine needles. And the next morning I drank it. And by that evening, I regretted it. I had missed one safety tip. The safety tip was not anything about the pine tree. He was not at fault. The safety tip was where to harvest. I knew better than this. I was lazy. Don't do that. Don't be lazy. Or at least be lazy enough to not even harvest. Um, I harvested from an apartment complex that almost certainly sprayed that tree. And so I had a really nice tea of pine needle and, you know, probably dioxin. And it was delicious. Um, and I actually had some side effects from that for a good long time. Um, thankfully, they finally receded, but they lasted for years. So don't drink pesticides, okay? Um, generally, a lot of the pesticides used today are a little bit less harsh than they were back in the 70s. Um, but... You still want to avoid them. So, don't harvest where there have probably been things sprayed or you don't know. Don't harvest next to train tracks, especially. They are allowed to use special pesticides that nowhere else is allowed to. Um, and so you just steer clear of train tracks by a good 30 feet at the very least. Um, and then lastly, if there's a whole bunch of traffic, which compared to... So when I'm thinking a whole bunch of traffic, I mean like all the time. The car exhaust can get and coat the plants and then it actually can get into the soil and things like that. In this kind of area, I'm not nearly as concerned about it. Um, there are There is traffic, but it's not so heavy and the air here is pretty clean. Um, so that one doesn't come up quite as much, but it's good to keep on the radar if you're going somewhere else. So um, those are harvesting tips. There are always more of them. If you're harvesting near water, make sure that the water is um, not contaminated. I guess that'd be the last big one. Water carries a lot of stuff, not always good, and that's usually our fault. Um, and plants really like to pick it up. Last tip is going back to safety for you. If you are on medications, you probably um, would like to know that about 70 to 90 percent of medications were originally sourced from plants. And then we have concentrated them and synthesized them, but they were originally found in plants. So it makes sense that there would be interactions. So, if you're taking medications and you're going to be using a plant medicinally, heaven forbid garlic, you know, go for it. But for lots of plants, you can have an interaction with your medication. So you want to talk to your doctor. Even if they're not a naturopathic doctor, they have access to data banks for what is safe with the pharmaceuticals. And they can do a cross-check if you're going to be taking a medicinal level. So, with that, we finished the most thrilling part of our presentation today. Any questions on safety or harvesting? Well, um, if, how do you check your, for yourself with your, is there a way you can check online for um, counterindicated with which medicines? There is. Um, so there are drug interaction checkers or what they're called. And some of them have herbs. The ones that tend to be best for herbs usually are paid. Um, I like Natural Medicines Database. That said, it usually is best if you're going to be taking things medicinally, either that you have a good background um, or that you talk to a doctor because the drug interaction database requires a little bit of, it's, it's about half of the equation. The other half is knowing your health and your body um, conditions. And so, for example, there are some herbs that I would be okay people having um, unless they have heart issues that are slightly, con like if they have congestive heart failure <coughs> and they're taking this herb 
this herb and they're on no medications, then taking this herb is a problem. And so it's, when I'm up here, I try to advocate the most conservative and safe thing. And the most conservative and safe thing is to go ahead and <coughs> run it by a doctor. Mm -hmm. But yes, you can do some checking on your own with drug interaction checkers. Okay. Um, Natural Medicines database is one that has herbs in it pretty well. And that's what I would probably count on. A lot of the other ones are a little bit more spotty. Um, but good question. So, did I answer that okay? Yes, thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Good stuff. Well, <coughs> we will crack into our three friends here today. These all grow locally in the Ozarks, and they all are very common. So we don't need to worry about anything endangered here. Um, our first guy actually likes to grow through the spring and the summer and the fall, and, and you'll have a little bit of a hard time finding too much of him in the winter. And that's why we have a very old looking leaf here, because this is what I have available right now. Oh, look at that. Shazam. I forgot that I actually updated it. So now we have a much better looking leaf. Anyone want to take a guess on what this guy is? is Go ahead. Mullen? Yes. What is that? This is Mullen. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and pop this leaf out. I trust you guys. Be gentle, but go ahead and rub the leaf just a little, or pet it, or whatever you want to. So, I was thinking lamb zoo because of the texture. This guy is also known as lamb's ear. Oh, also <laughs> known <laughs> in Latin as verbascum thapsis. Yeah, okay. Now, why Latin? <laughs> The reason we have Latin is because there are about 1,400 plants that are called snakeweed in common tongue. And so if someone says, what's snakeweed good for? I'll say everything. It just depends on which one you grab. Um, and so if we have a Latin name, then we can be sure of the plant that we're talking about. At least that's the idea. Botanists also, uh, in order to get their last degree, they have to have a thesis. That means they have to mess with what's already there, and so things get renamed all the time. But um, a lot of them stay a lot more stable than the common names. So mullen is uh, actually a plant that has some really cool history to it. It's been around for a really long time, um, as many plants have. But this one has had lots of uh, interactions with humans for a long time. Matter of fact, the name mullen is thousands of years old. That's one that's been passed down all the way for so long that we aren't sure where it came from. We have a few guesses, though. Very old Latin has the word mollus, which means soft. That's our best guess about where mullen came from. <clears throat> and so this very soft leaf also has seen um, some uses with its uh, flowering stalk, actually. So here's the flowering stalk of mullen. It gets pretty tall up there. It likes to shoot flowers off at one layer at a time. In medieval England, or English territories at the very least, it, in the uh, countryside, there was a uh, common practice, kind of a will he, won't he, picking off the flower petal type thing, except with Molin, the uh, <clears throat> trepidatious but love-struck individual would go up to the Molin and say, oh, Molin plant, does my lover truly love me? Just like that. And then they would bend the mullein plant down towards the house of the person that they were interested in. And then they would let go. And if the mullein sprung back up with vigor and strength, mm -hmm. then that means all was well. Oh, he or she really does like me. Oh, I feel so butterflies. And, but, woe betide the individual if the mullein plant fell down. That would mean something was afoot. The love was not strong. And so then there would be a tongue lashing, and they, you can blame that on mullen. So um, it also is featured in one of my favorite stories. Perhaps you've heard of it, the ancient Greek Odyssey. And so the Odyssey and the Iliad are two stories that were had across a lot of, uh, they were considered some of the peak culture of the Greek um, era. And in that, there is um, Odysseus. He is a warrior that is going, and he has a huge army of men, and they're trying to make it back home after a war safely. 
And because this is a Greek tragedy, uh, his men, you can count them on no fingers by the time he reaches a certain island called Circe's Island. Um, Circe was purported to be a sorcerer, and one of the things that Molin is supposed to be really good for is protection. And so there's a fun line that actually bears into harvesting Molin just a little bit as well, um, where it says, And Odysseus prayed to the gods above, and one who favored him came down and pulled up a plant that no mortal could ever unroot, but the gods can do whatever they please. And then he, they gave it to Odysseus, and it protected him from Circe, Circe, the sorcerer, because of its protective capabilities. Now, um, the plant that they were referring to was mullen, and I'll have you know, I pulled up a mullen plant without anything else, so I have godlike strength, apparently. <laughs> the trick of that, when harvesting mullen, so now coming back to modern day and just a little bit more, the trick of harvesting mullen with its tough roots is you want to go ahead and pull it up right after it's rained, and then it's much easier to pull up. So, lots of fun stories, and I could keep going on these. They're really fun, but what about the uses in today's more scientific background? Molin actually is a really good kind of triple herb. It has three parts. Lots of people hear about one. Many hear about two. Very few actually hear about all three, because one of them's pretty hidden. So we're gonna go through each of those. We'll start with the flowers. This is the one that a lot of people might be familiar with. Very useful though. The flowers, they come off of this stalk that comes up off the mullein plant after it's, when it's in its second year. First year it stays close to the ground. We'll talk about identification a little bit. And then it shoots off flowers from the buds in layers and it goes up through the season until it flowers all the way. Those flowers are actually very good medicine. They have an action, um, which in herbal tongue, an action is a big summary of what the herb does. It doesn't tell you all the mechanisms it does, but it's just like we're thinking about this kind of um, effect. The action of the flowers is analgesic, or pain relieving. And so a lot of mothers through the eras would take mullein flowers, and still today actually, you can even buy mullein flower oil. Um, it's still used. And they would infuse it in the oil. Usually extra virgin olive oil is the go-to today. Um, but they would infuse it in the oil, and they would take a few drops of that oil after it had infused for about two to six weeks. And they would put it when their child has an ear infection, just pain. Middle ear is very sensitive. And they would put a few drops of mullein oil in the child's ear, and it would take the pain down. And so then that it, it could relax. And so the flowers are really good for anodyne or pain relieving. You can use it elsewhere too. Something else they're good at is spasmolytic. They relax muscles. Also helps with middle ear infection. There is something that is commonly missed, however, with mullein. A lot of people use mullein oil all on its own. It doesn't actually kill the microbes that are causing the ear infection. So when using it this way, it's best mixed with something like garlic oil that's got some punch, but is safe for the child. Or the adult, if you've got an ear infection. My condolences. So, number one, the flower. Anodyne and spasmolytic. Okay? Number two, we come down to the plant and the leaves, the big fuzzies. Those guys. They are actually... Um, some people talk about something called the Doctrine of Signatures. It's not something I subscribe to, but it's kind of fun to help remember. Um, they look a little bit like lungs if you put them together at the top. And if that helps you remember, they uh, are an extremely good tonic for the lungs. Um, if you go ahead and make a mullein tea and you use that, it helps. Uh, we have little finger projections all through our lungs. And we have some phlegm, goopy stuff, mucus that's in there that helps protect the coating. But it's supposed to, the little fingers, they wave, and they make the goop, the mucus, go up, and so that it doesn't get too much in the lungs. And if we get sick, that mucus protects us, but it also has a bunch of bad guys in it, so we want it to go up and out. Um, those little fingers are called cilia, and they're in the lungs. But mullein helps them move faster, so you get all the stuff coming up and out much faster. And it helps you cough it up. There's a word for that as well. It's called expectorant. That's the action of the leaves. 
Molin is actually kind of special in its expectorant qualities because there are two kinds of expectorant. There's a uh, stimulating expectorant. You ever had someone that has a really weak cough that's not doing any good? <laughs> that's not going to get anything out. Um, stimulating expectorant. That's what you want to help. <coughs> you know, get something moving. Now, if you have someone who's going, <coughs> they can't stop until all the air is gone. Um, they don't need a stimulating expectorant. They're already doing enough coughing. That, and it would be a little bit more forceful than what I just did, but I don't want to just, you know, gift you with all of my lung <laughs> contents. Um, a relaxing expectorant is something that you want for that, is to go ahead and calm the cough down, but not completely get rid of it, but still help get rid of all the crap. Loosen the crap, calm the cough. Mullen is special. It's one that is in it's, it's got a place in a very small third category. Not very many plants are in this category. Molin is a mixed expectorant. It actually helps bring weak coughs up and strong coughs down. It brings it to the middle. Really nice. And so this is a nice, um, just safe and effective and versatile, recognizable plant. This is one that's really nice to just kind of know and have on the back burner. Um, fun story with this. I was really excited at one point because oh, my wife got sick. It was great. And so I got to go ahead and make her some mullen tea, and I was so proud of myself. It, at the time, it was the first time I had made molin tea, and I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I know all the stuff and the things, and I gave her a cup of molin tea, and she drank half of it, and she's like, ah, oh, you know that number one doesn't taste as nasty as I thought it would? Yes, score. <laughs> number two, it actually is starting to help. I feel like stuff coming up. I feel my cough not being as bad, and I feel less crappy, and I was like, oh, yes, I am. I am that good, and thank you. <laughs> and then she drank the rest of the cup. And Taylor... Uh, Dr. Goodwin had made a little bit of a mistake. Um, so you guys felt the leaf, right? Nice and fuzzy. So calming. Oh darn, those fuzzes come off. And so guess what hit the back of my wife's throat? <laughs> she suddenly had fur for the back of her throat. Not very good for calming a cough anymore. So she had that there for what? Two, three days, I think. Um, so, pro tip, when you're making tea for someone, use cheesecloth, cheesecloth, yeah. yeah, or a French press with a nice fine mesh, or don't, if, you know, it's like, you deserve this, you know, <laughs> that's up to you. So, I had had uh, good six cups with no problems beforehand, so I just figured, but of course, you know, lucky number seven, so. Um, Mullen leaves also have um, some other uses and things like that, but lung tonic, it's also just generally good for moving uh, fluids near the lung. How many of you have heard of, maybe, this is a little bit rare, how many of you have heard of blood? <laughs> All right, good. How many of you have heard of the second guy, lymph? Yeah. Lymph? Okay, we got a few head nods. So, awesome, we have some science nerds in here, and that's a compliment, by the way. Um, yeah, I wrote down silly and then you said that thing's finger sounds like Oh, you just wrote <laughs> happiness. Um, so, the yeah. uh, lymph is just a little bit of a, a review. We have blood vessels, they take the blood everywhere. Blood, um, particularly the plasma portion of blood, escapes the blood vessels and gives nourishment to all the different cells in the body. Some of that makes its way back into the bloodstream. Some of it, however, doesn't. It goes on this other roundabout travel to make it home. And that's through the lymph system, another set of vessels. Um, some interesting things about the lymph, the heart doesn't move the lymph. The heart pumping, that's blood vessels. What moves the lymph? That is muscle movement. We actually have saran wrapped muscles, in case you didn't know. That's why saran wrap's such a popular brand. Um, it's called fascia, though, in the body. And so if something's wrapped and then it tries to get larger or move or squish or twist. Since it's wrapped, all that pressure goes into an area that's squishable inside of those wraps. And that's the lymph vessels. They're on purpose kept inside. The lymph will be squished and moved up and then there are one-way valves. So as soon as it moves up, it won't come back. Um, 
this is really important because it also lets all of that lymph and plasma and vicariously the blood be checked for infections or bad guys. And we have things called lymph nodes. And those are basically um, TSA stations, airport stations, where it's like, all right, who's coming in? Let me check everything. And you're clear. Next. You, you owe me a donut. All right, now you can go. Next, you know. Um, and so the lymph really helps with the immune system as well as cleaning up all the garbage. And then eventually it rejoins the blood uh, above, above the uh, superior vena cava, um, near the heart. Rejoins the blood near the heart. Why are we talking about all this? Because molymph is a lymphagogue, leaves are. And that's its third action, specifically around the lungs. And so you can imagine if you're sick, you want all that lymph moving. And so all the bad stuff in the lungs can go through the TSA checkpoints. And it's like, aha, we found the bad guy. Now we can make an army to go kill it. We want that to happen better. We also don't want it to get all boggy and feel like our lungs are full of fluid because that's not fun. I don't know about you, um, <clears throat> but being waterlogged above water is not the best. Being waterlogged below water is probably worse. But anyway, um, don't do either. That's my advice. There you go. Professional. I told you. All right. Um, with the leaves, though, they are a lymphagogue, so that's their last action. Lots of it all targeted around the lungs, so it gives you lots of really good actions. It is fairly gentle. So, would I use Molin alone to go ahead and take care of all of someone's symptoms or problems? Maybe if it was super, like, a mild cold, I probably still would mix other things in, but it's a very good addition. Um, I guess there is one other fun thing. I can't help myself. Squirrel. Um, one other fun thing about the leaves, uh, you can actually take them and rub them and redden your skin. And actually Amish individuals, I don't know if they still do this today, but they were known um, back in the uh, settling colonial days, they would take it, it was called Amish, Amish Rouge, because they would rub it, the ladies would rub it on their cheeks when they wanted blush. Um, so with that action, it's called Rubifacent, or to make red. And that actually, redness, is coming from blood flow to the area. And that is more important than one might think. Um, I had a friend back in medical school. Hopefully I still have a friend. Um, and she, she told me an interesting story from about, oh, I think it was like seven years before then, but don't quote me on how long it was. If you ever find her and she tells you different, then there you go. But uh, some years before I met her, she had had an injury right in her ulnar nerve, where the funny bone, you know, wah, you know, it shoots right up to the underside of your arm and it really hurts. She'd had an injury, and instead of having that funny bone sensation all up this side of the arm, she actually just had no sensation. She'd lost all of it. She could still move everything. Thankfully, the, the motor parts, uh, the motor nerves, they weren't injured, just the sensory ones. That's still no fun. Sensory tend to be a little less protected because they're a little less essential. Um, but, uh, Years after that, still before I met her, she went and she started harvesting stinging nettle. Mm -hmm. And um, she's perhaps even more natural than I am because she did it without gloves intentionally. Mm -hmm. And she did it for four days. And she did it, to, I want to be one with the plants. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, admire her courage. And uh, something really fascinating happened. Day three, very red hands, as you might imagine extremely red, all the way up, all the way up. She started feeling her fingers again. These are the two that are innervated by the ulnar nerve. She started feeling everything down there. A month later, the healing had, had continued and she had 90% of her mm. sensation back that had been gone for years. Mm. And that was because blood flow was brought to the area. If anyone has heard of PRP, platelet-rich plasma injections. Um, they basically take some of your blood, they swirl it up all fancy, and then they put it back. Um, that is something I, I advocate and I recommend people who have like rotator cuff tears. Few things are better than some PRP. Mm -hmm. And it's just putting your own blood in a certain area. Um, and to the day that I met and talked with this individual, her fingers were still at 90%. She never got the last 10% back. 
but that's amazing. So reddening an area, bringing blood to an area, actually really helps with healing um, certain kinds of injuries. And that's something people don't expect. And so next time you see some stinging nettle, go ahead and dive in. Responsibly. <laughs> and then don't say that I told you to do that when people ask. <laughs> oh, now you don't have to feel bad when you push other people in. That's what we're doing here. Okay, I'll sit on this side of the table. All right. It's all right, your walk suit's just getting all absorption. Uh, so um, that is a whole bunch of really cool things about mullein leaf. However, now we get to the secret part of the medicine that very few people know about. It's one that actually, so traditional medicine, traditional herbalism, tons of very valuable things have been found. Many of the things that I just mentioned were only found because they were used for hundreds if not thousands of years. And then recently we had studies to go ahead and say, oh, yeah, those, you know, 642,000 people, mm -hmm. herbalists, knew what they were talking about. Surprise, you know. Um, and so we have studies that validate it. Occasionally they are, um, occasionally the studies reveal things that are not as we thought they were as well. So I highly value having both sides of the coin. I find it gives you the most complete picture. But this latest one is one that's a little less um, well known in, in traditional use or modern day use, but uh, it's got good backing. Um, the root. No one talks about mullein root. Well, we're talking about it today. Mullein root. Uh, first off, I'm going to give you a little bit of botany because you're my captive audience. <laughs> um, and this is to help so that you know it'll play into how to use the root. So there's a reason. But mullein is a two year plant. We call it a biennial. Bi for two, annual for annual, meaning year. Biennial. First year, mullein comes up and it puts out its fuzzy, lamier leaves all around in a circle from a single point in the base of the earth. And so it's a spiral, a circle. We call this a rosette because it's, you know, rose has petals all the way around the center bit, so they named it a rosette. We call it a basal rosette because this is coming out of the ground. Basal means baseline or ground layer. Um, this nerdy botanical term will help you identify a lot of plants. Um, and it'll also help you with mullein knowing how old mullein is. First year, it's a basal rosette only. No flowering stalk. Then it dies back for a year, or a winter. And then it comes back the second year, basal rosette. And then around early summer, late summer, some, whenever it decides to, I've noticed the Ozarks are a little bit crazy in deciding what season everything is. It's really interesting. We had three springs this year. Um, and it will shoot up from its basal rosette a stalk like this. There's a lot more stalk underneath it. And the majority of the leaves are still the basal rosette, but this stalk will shoot up. All these buds will be green and fuzzy as well. That's a second year old. The root is only good after it. Uh, the root is only good after the first year and before the second year. So you want to harvest it late fall or very early spring or winter. So that's why we're talking about it now. Is mullein root is in season. You want to get the end of the first year plant, the beginning of the second year plant. So if you find a dead mullein that's got a stalk like this. They're biennial, they're not triennial, which isn't a thing, they just call it perennial after two years. Uh, after it's thrown up its flowering stalk, it's just gonna die off. There's not really too much left. Anything that you harvest off of it will have a little bit of medicine, um, but it's used its energy for this. So when you're harvesting the root, you want one that has had a year to build up, but it hasn't used it all up on the flowering stalk. It sends all of the energy down to the root in between its first and second year, and that's when the medicine is strongest. So harvesting the root, why? Well, because then you can say you have the strength of the gods because you pulled one up. No, well, yes, maybe a little. But um, the root is really good for something that's kind of hard to get a hold of. It's a connective tissue tonic. There aren't a whole lot of plants that have that in abundance. Certainly not the ones that we go and uh, use from the grocery store, you know, the ones that we have in our diet. Not a lot of those are super great for your connective tissue. Connective tissue is an amazingly important um, substance in the body. Remember that saran wrap I was talking about around the muscles? That's called fascia, if you want the technical term, and that's connective tissue. 
Um, at the end of muscles, we have tendons and ligaments. Uh, ligaments are the ones that aren't attached to muscles. But anyway, those are both connective tissue. Underneath our skin, there's something called a basement membrane. That way our skin don't fall off. That's nice. Good feature. I approve. Um, that's connective tissue. If you have a hernia, oh darn, you had some connective tissue issues. If you, I could keep going. Connective tissue is everywhere, especially the joints, by the way. And so if you have a joint disease, connective tissue is really, really nice to get kind of up and running a little bit better. Um, because, uh, yeah, pretty much all the cartilage and the hyaline cartilage and then the synovial fluid and all the other stuff in the joints. I just said a lot of science words. It just means, hey, joints are made of connective tissue. And if you make it happy, then they make you happy. So mullein root is good for all of helping that be healthy, helping that be robust. Um, so that is something that uh, you would go ahead and grind down and you would dry it, grind it down into a powder, and then you would go ahead and have that either as a kind of, uh, you do an extraction. We can go into exactly how to do extractions another time, but um, <clears throat> depending on if it's water, uh, you, you need to get the right solubility. We'll talk about that at another point. But for the leaves and the flowers, the flowers you do in oil, you do an oil extraction, two to six weeks. You put flowers into extra virgin olive oil, and you go ahead and let it be in an airtight jar. All the flowers should be beneath the level of the oil, otherwise it might mold. Um, and then after two to six weeks, you have nice infused oil. How many flowers? How many can you fit? Um, for the leaves, usually used as a tea. Technically called an infusion because tea is actually Camilla sinensis. It's a plant. And then everyone just liked that so much that they had a Boston party. Um, and, uh, and then everything was called tea, but it's technically an herbal infusion. Um, but that's how you use the leaves. The roots, there's an extraction process. And um, to be completely honest with you, I'm trying to remember the percentage of extraction between hydrophilic and hydrophobic. And so that's why I'm going to go ahead and leave it on the side there. But um, the, that's, that's Mullen. So, and uh, any questions about verbascum thapsis? Toxicity. Toxicity. Aha, <laughs> Someone knows their stuff. Excellent. So, mullein is a fairly safe plant. Um, I would still go ahead and, you know, cross-check with your doc if you're taking medications. That doesn't come off the table very often. There are a couple plants that I'll be like, yeah, I'll go ahead and say go ahead and do it. Like Plantago, you're good. Um, mullein, pretty dang safe. Um, <clears throat> I would have to, I haven't done an exhaustive check against every medication ever, but I have never heard of one that it interacts with. Um, but I always like to go and check the databases because they've got thousands of things and those aren't all memorized. So, um, besides that, lookalikes and identification. Let's go with identification, then we'll do lookalikes. So I already told you about basil rosette. You felt the leaves and you've seen the flower stalk. If you see the flower stalk, this is, uh, the one problem with that is that means that you just found a plant at the end of its medicinal usefulness. But it really helps you identify. So there really aren't lookalikes that have leaves like that. So find one that has a stalk, play with the leaves for enough time that you feel confident, you know, look at the underside, feel the stalks, feel the fuzz. And once you're really confident, Honestly, this guy doesn't really have lookalikes that are really noticeable. So um, that's just one of the reasons I like to teach him is he's just really friendly. Um, last thing that I'll leave you with is another name is Indian toilet paper. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of reasons why that's probably not an appropriate name. Not least of which, because if you were a Boy Scout, um, I didn't do this, but there are stories. Uh, Boy Scouts who took the name literally and uh, those hairs come off. <laughs> Don't, okay? You're desperate, but you're not that desperate. All right, moving on. Next, we have our lovely, anybody want to take a guess? Pine, here we go. Here we have a lovely pine tree. So, this is the entire tree. All right, we have a pine sprig. So, um, the pine, there is. there are dozens of types of pines. Um, the genus is uh, the pine genus, however, there's a little bit of a split opinion 
Some people say all pines, including some professionals that I trust very heavily. Um, Green Dean, for his, I like people who have a sense of humor, I guess, but Green Dean in Florida, uh, he's a very good resource. If anyone's looking for someone to go ahead and have a good resource for their back checking and stuff, he's one to go ahead and keep in mind. He's not the only one that I go to. I go to several before I have confidence in something. But he says all pine trees are edible. There are some other people who disagree and say that almost all pine trees are edible. So um, <clears throat> take that for what you will. Pine trees tend to be pretty friendly. Um, they do, however, have a few lookalikes. So don't let me forget to tell you about that because I will. <laughs> But uh, some fun things about the pine tree. I already told you my fun pine tree story where I made a tea and uh, there were pesticides on it. <clears throat> so don't do that. Another story about the pine tree is um, Native Americans actually would uh, use the pine tree, some of them year round. Others would use it as a starvation food. So when the winter came, if they hadn't had enough stored up or if their stores went moldy or got ruined, and they needed more, or maybe their tribe just surged in numbers. The pine tree was a kind of the backup option. This was the emergency food storage. And um, Native Americans would go to the pine tree, and then they would take the, excuse me, the outer bark off, and then the, there is something called the cambium, the inner bark. It feels, excuse me, more alive and moist than the outer bark, which is actually a dead tree, but still part of the tree. It's a shield. Um, the inner bark, they would then go ahead and um, hack out, and they would take it in vertical strips, not horizontal, number one, because that's easier. Number two, if you do horizontal, um, we'll talk about how that's really bad for the tree in a little bit. But you take the vertical stripes out, and then they would lay it out, and different tribes did different things, so I'm going to be kind of generic and general with this. but. You can beat it out into um, <clears throat> kind of more spread out, not as adhered together. And so you have splinters, let that dry, and then grind it once it's dry. And that has a frick ton of fiber, which gives you no calories. But it also has pine sugars, and that's where they would get their calories. Um, and so the uh, pine sugars also can be extracted because sugars are soluble in water. You can also make a pine bark tea if you boil it. So that's another method you can do and you drink that and you get some calories. Um, if you've ever watched those survivalist shows, mm -hmm. I see them walk by a pine tree and I'm like, why? No, stop, go back. You have something perfect right there. And they never do it. <sighs> One day. Um, so pine trees, beyond that, they also have fun history in the turpentine kind of... Uh, uh, industry. Turpentine is used in lots of things, from paint thinner to cosmetics to medicinal applications. Turpentine was actually quite the industry, still is, but quite the industry in medieval ages. It, um, <clears throat> once it was developed, things moved that way a lot. It brought lots of revolutions along <clears throat> in the sense of knowledge. And so pine resin is where the turpentine can be processed from. Um, turpentine is, if you have very small amounts, it's medicinal. If you have a lot, not the very best. So don't just go take some pine resin and just like chew on it. Um, I wouldn't say that it's like poisonous or toxic exactly because you, turpentine is a very concentrated version. So don't drink turpentine. But the pine tree has diluted amounts of that. Make sense? So, um, but the, uh, and the resin excretes out on the outside in globs. But, um, <clears throat> Now, what about today? What about our uses for this? Well, it is a good emergency food source, but it also has some really cool um, edible and medicinal uses. Number one, the needles are a really easy trail site nibble. And here's a fun thing that I have found. I don't see this in any books anywhere, but I've tried a lot of pine trees because I guess I'm Yule Gibbons today. Um, but every pine tree tastes a little different. Mm -hmm. I have had some pine trees that were actually sweet and lemony. And I was like, oh, I, I marked down where that one was. And it's like, that's my pine tree. And then I've had others that are bitter. And then I've had others that are so sharp and just, they, they dry your mouth out like that. And it's just puckering. And so they all have pine strongly in the background. 
or up to the foreground, but the rest of it can actually dance around quite a bit, so find your favorite. Um, so that's a fun thing, but it's a good trail side nibble, and um, also you can make a very nice tea out of the needles. Why would you want to do that? Well, let's talk about a few of the actions of the pine tree. The needles in particular are what we're talking about right now. The needles are antiviral. There's a substance in them called shikimic acid, if anyone likes that level of detail. And question, how many of you guys have heard of, off store shelves, Tamiflu? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Guess what Tamiflu is? Shikimic acid. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> or at least a synthetic relative of it. When, vi when flu virus comes into us, um, it likes to, it has lots of little grappling hooks, little sticky hand things, and it'll go up and go stick on the outside of the cell and shoop inside after it's stuck. Tamiflu takes tennis balls, let's say, and sticks them on the end of little sticky things. Now he just boom, just bounces off. And so now he has tennis balls everywhere and he's going to be a pro one day. Believe in him. But he's not going to make you sick anymore. Shikimic acid does the same thing. And so pine needles are really good for keeping the flu back, in particular. Um, <clears throat> if you already have the flu, it'll help prevent the flu to making it as to as many cells. It won't necessarily directly kill off the virus, but it prevents it from replicating nicely. Um, so antiviral, in that sense. <laughs> Not one that I would use on every kind of virus under the sun, but for flu and cold. Um, it also has nice vitamin C, vitamin A, and um, some uh, proanthocyanidins, and there's a mouthful for you. But basically what those are good for is they're also when fresh. They don't do super great once they're dried, and that's one of the reasons we don't have a whole lot of connective tissue help. They're helpful for connective tissue as well. This is a little bit more mild, um, but proanthocyanidins, I am positive, used to be a part of everybody's everyday diet. And they aren't anymore, because we don't eat fresh, fresh stuff terribly often. And what we do is the narrow window of what's available in the grocery store. And that's not to say that things in the grocery store don't have medicinal value. Absolutely, all those fruits and veggies, very much advocate for. Just like to have a little bit more selection. Um, so, hmm? Oh yeah, thanks. <coughs> this is my wife, by the way. <laughs> <clears throat> so, the action that correlates with all those lovely goodies that I just mentioned, C, A, and uh, a number of others, and proanthocyanidins, etc., etc., we like to wrap that all up in the term nutritive. All right? Basically, this is good for you. <laughs> so, um, when you're hiking, you can just throw, you can take some needles, break them up, bend them so that all their cells are willing to release all the goodies inside and just throw them in your water bottle and seal it back up and it'll make a tea as you go. It's best had in a warm or cool tea. A very hot one can slightly damage some of the nutrients. I'm not too worried about it though, because um, you'll still get a good amount of them. So, um, <clears throat> there is something called Pycnogenol, which is a brand name for pine bark extract. And they market it as a pharmaceutical uh, supplement, I should say. Market it as a supplement, and that's great. It's very good. It helps with memory, helps with blood vessel support, helps with uh, blood sugar. I'm using the same fingers over and over. I'm just waving my pinkies. Um, and the uh, also good for blood lipids and cholesterol. And so basically, blood vessel stuff, the outside and the inside. Pycnogenol is expensive. I like pine needle tea. It's not expensive. <laughs> and so you get those proanthocyanidins, that's what pycnogenol is. So those proanthocyanidins are actually sold as a supplement that's kind of pricey. Um, and yes, uh, for some people I will prescribe that or recommend that, depending on which state I'm in. Um, different legal things for wording um, on whether you recommend or prescribe supplements. but. Um, yeah, so whenever you can get a nice, free, local, safe source of something, 
I like to veer that way. Fresher is almost always better. Mushrooms are an exception. They like being heated and then they're actually more nutritious. They're strange that way and a lot of other ways. We have one tree that big. I found it out in our... I took it. This is... This big. probably... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you would have had to go up through the dogs, but... No, no I, we don't have, on our acreage, we don't have any pines. And I found one hey. the other day and it's that big right now and I'm like... Wanting to paint a big circle <laughs> around it so when he brush hogs or does anything, it doesn't get taken out. <laughs> oh, do it. Yeah, this is a good guy to have around. Uh, the needles actually have another benefit, just to make you feel even more protective. Um, <laughs> it's actually... Fence? Hmm? What? Electric fence. Electric fence? <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say no. <laughs> um, the... Uh, <laughs> um, Sorry, I had like shock collars come into my mind, and it's like, keep them away! All right, that's going too far. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, plants are cool. So it's possible. <laughs> Who's going to have them on? Um, all right. Okay. Squirrel. I like squirrels. Best meal I ever had. No. Um, the, uh, right, we're talking about pine needles. So... They found in the medieval ages something really cool, and it's like shocking, not shocking sort of a thing, where it's like, oh my gosh, but not really, that kind of makes sense. There were people who would go to war, you know, like that always happens, and they would have some war trauma, which is not fun. It's very, very, you know, it's a very significant issue, kind of PTSD. And they would be kind of shell-shocked, is what they would call it later, but... Um, they would have mental institutions to try to help, and they often were very secluded or cloistered or closeted away and not a whole lot of success a lot of the time and then someone's like why don't we try moving them out to the countryside and lo and behold a lot of them started getting better now this is a long time ago this isn't a study it's a fun story but it reminds me of some studies that we have today you go through a pine forest and there's actually something called forest bathing quotation marks around bathing you're not actually bathing what you're doing is you're going through a forest and experiencing all that all around you. And if you go bathing, just don't tell anyone. Um, the studies today show that just the scent of something called alpha panine, it's a molecule in the pine tree, all of them, just the scent helped people who had anxiety, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and memory issues. And it brought those moderately down. Did it cure them? No. You go walk through a pine forest, it won't necessarily cure you of all of those things. But it had measurable impact on those conditions. And I actually, back in Arizona, <clears throat> when I was working in the clinic there, I would prescribe to people, there is a place called the Gilbert Riparian Preserve. Riparian means riverside. There's a little, it's very well preserved. And that's a place where you can find pine trees. And I would say, go walk that and just breathe it in and be outside. There's a lot of stuff from sunlight as well. Other plants release things, it's not just pine trees, but actually getting fresh air. There's a reason people say, you know, if you read the old, you know, Jane Austen kind of style, the old novels of, uh, you know, oh, what do they call it, what's that era? Whatever the era is where there's all the, uh, late industrial era, where, um, or the Renaissance era. Anyway, they all say, go to the countryside for your health. and. And there's actually substantiation to that, where if you go where there are birds, bird sounds also have measurable impact, which is really fascinating, but that's on the psychological side. We're talking the physical side. Um, they are joined, everything's joined. But just going and smelling all of these things and having these compounds come in actually changes blood levels of inflammation markers and things. And so I would prescribe for people to go and experience that. Out here, we're already out here, so that's great. Um, I don't tend to prescribe or recommend that as much here because yeah, people go outside their front door. <laughs> so, but, uh, the allergens here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> happy. Um, there are things to do about that too, but it takes a little while. I'm still working on it myself. Eat more wild things. Um, I have the... an allergic reaction to bee pollen. Because um... my parents are beekeepers and my husband made me take some. He called my mother as I'm not able to breathe, and she said, give her some more. 
That's not the recommendation that I would make. Your mom is trying to kill you. (laughs) (laughs) She still has that insurance policy. (laughs) All right. Well. She meant after I was done. Let it be known. (laughs) She was here in person, alive today. It's on video, so we can't have any other story. We know. All right. If it happens, we have evidence that she knew it was coming. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So it's premeditated at this point. Um, so lots of really cool things in the in the humble pine tree. Now, I mentioned lookalikes, and even more surprising, I remembered that I mentioned lookalikes. We're going to talk about how to identify a pine tree, which you would think is like it looks like a pine tree. Technically yeah. correct, but there's a little more. Pine trees, yeah, I guess I'll bring everything around. At the base, I'll show future you guys, because there you go. At the base, there's a little wrap around the needles. Mm -hmm. And if you pull them off, you can see that wrap usually comes with it. Sometimes you can pull just the needles, but there's a wrap. That wrap or sheath is called a fascicle for those who want to increase their nerdiness quotient. Okay. Only pine trees have needles with fascicles. If you see a fascicle and needles, you're good. To stay on the even safer side, what I recommend is only things that have two through five needles in a bunch inside the fascicle. And if you do that, it's a pine tree. Okay? Two to five needles inside of a fascicle. There are all the lookalikes don't either don't have fascicles. I mean, they don't have fascicles. None of them do. They don't have fascicles, but sometimes, you know, you can look at it and be like, is that a fascicle that just looks weird? You know, because it's got a little bumpy thing towards, is it just a really short fascicle? So it's nice to have a backup so that you can be sure or whatever. But um, when in doubt, go without. Just putting that out there again. But a lot of the lookalikes have single needles. There are, there are like the pinion pine, that, that's a true pine tree and it only has a single needle. Um, but just to keep you further away from mistakes, I'm saying look for two to five and just leave the pinion pine alone because there are so many other pine trees to pick from. Why go for the one that's closest to look likes, right? So two to five for safety purposes. Um, and <clears throat> if you want the safest pine tree, I remember how I mentioned earlier how some professionals say all pine trees are edible, some say most. If you would like the safest pine tree, the one that's very easy to identify and we know that it's safe and everything like that, the white pine has five needles and the fascicle. It's the only one that has five needles. I feel like a secretary over here. (laughs) Pointed at me, looking at me, and I go, oh, okay, we'll write that. (laughs) There is a recording, but... There is a recording, hello. (laughs) But, uh, I mean... (laughs) <laughs> this way you don't have to listen to my bad jokes twice, so I understand. It makes me feel a little bit sad, but... Um, so, five needles and a fascicle, you've got quite pine, and then you can be really comfortable. Pine trees also tend to have these things, and they're great for throwing at your siblings. That's about what they're good for. Um, pine cone. So, if it's got a pine cone, then that's a really good indication you have a pine tree as well. There are a few other things that can have things that... Some people are like, is that a tiny pine cone that's kind of soft and bendy? Technically, that's not a pine cone. Those ones that release pollen, Mm -hmm. those are catechins. Um, And don't write that one down. I might have that name slightly wrong. I always need to review that one. (laughs) She didn't Um, look at me, so we're good. All right. So, (laughs) uh, I hope she pays you well. Um, I got her Star Wars. You can pay for that. (laughs) Um, But uh, pine... Nuts are actually seeds from inside the pine cone. Now, spoiler, uh, most of those are actually minuscule. And if you're in a survival situation, you will expend more energy trying to get those things than you're going to get out of them. A very few pine trees have larger ones, the pinion pine being one of them. Ooh, temptation to go to the single needle pine. Um, Pine nuts are so good. So, pine nuts... Yeah. Pine nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pine They're nuts. expensive. They There's are. a reason harvesting them is like, all right. But if you want to get pine nuts, here's a way to get your own. Um, number one, identify your thing, etc., and be safe. And then you take the pine cones and you put them in a warm oven. 
they open up and then you just and they come out now most of them again are like mustard seed size they're really small so you're not going to get a whole lot flavor there the flavor i can't say i've tried a whole lot of varieties of pine nuts so (laughs) you can go and have some they they turned out really yummy and i had some where it was like eating sawdust yeah Yeah. so it's like the needles then all right very variable (laughs) our pine nut consultant over here says that the flavor is very variable with the pine nuts but I don't have so, a way to verify how old the pine the, um, is. The pine tree, we've talked about a number of cool things about it. Um, but with that, I think we'll go ahead and say that's what we have for today on the pine tree. Any questions? But what tree looks like a pine but isn't? Oh, thank you. I said, I won't forget lookalikes. Hey, I did forget lookalikes, and then I didn't talk about the lookalikes. Well, you sort of did. Uh, I talked about how to tell them apart, but you're very kind. Yes, I'll take it. See, I, I just, this is an expansion. Um, there are, well, let me pull oh, this I guy. Was, I was pointing, to, I thought the cedar is one I oh. tend to mix up. So this is a juniper tree. Oh, so wrong. Tree. And many people call it cedar. Okay. Which yeah. is the common yeah. tongue. Um, common. Um... But, uh, so s- junipers can be confused just because they're evergreen. And I'll take these two around. I mean, when you look at them at the same time, it's the easiest. Here, here's future, you guys. See, I will care tomorrow, too. But juniper versus pine. There are some other lookalikes. There are spruce trees. Oh, spruce. I always thought it was in the pine family. It's it not. can be it's used. Spruce. It can be used the same way, um, typically, but just for safety. For Christmas. Let's yeah. <laughs> for Christmas, everybody, if you would like to go ahead and have a pine needle, roll it between your fingers. You can keep it. There you go. I guess I should excited? probably go ahead and roll it between your fingers. Mm-hmm. I just realized I might be using this again really soon. Oh, I can't. Yeah, no, I told no, you, you, you did. did. You're the favorite. Yeah. Sorry, everybody else. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. I just gave you some free pine needle tea. Pricey stuff. Um, so. It's flat. Yeah. yeah. Spruces are square. Mm. S and S. Spruce, square. You roll it, and it goes da 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 Because it is a square needle. It is also a single needle. So we already told you how to tell it apart. This guy has a fascicle and a bundle, spruce. They are square and they are single. But an, and then they're really easy to roll because they're squares and you feel the angles as you roll them. There is another tree, the U tree, Y-E-W. This one you really don't want to mix up. That one's poisonous and toxic and bad. Um, they actually would make bows out of yew wood back in the medieval era. And just holding that wood, the archers, they would sweat a lot because, you know, archery is really intense, especially when you're using non-compound bows, like simple bows. It's a lot harder than today's compound bows that a lot of people use that reduces the, the, the draw weight that you experience but still gives you the release force um, <clears throat> to make the arrow fly. But back then, you know, lots of sweat. That sweat would basically make a nice little sweat tea around their hand. Lovely. And uh, they would absorb you in their hand through the wood and as they're treating it and everything. And they would do this every day because that's their profession, is, you know, a soldier. And they had shorter lifespans. Uh, they, would, they would die from you poisoning. And people didn't know that because it was so slow <clears throat> doing it that way. Now, if you ate the yew tree, they did know I'm positive. Like, I haven't read anything, but of course they, they would know this. They lived among them. Um, if you ingest it, that's not good. Uh, toxic. Especially the seeds. Uh, this is not the pine tree, this is the yew tree. I'm just underscoring why it's important to tell the difference. Um, the yew berry is technically an aerial rather than a berry, but whatever. It looks like a berry. Um, and it has a little cup that has a seed in it, um, on the outside. And the seed is highly toxic. You will have a heart attack. That's what it does to you. There are some fun mystery novels where it's like, oh, who killed Mr. Body? Um, And they use yew seeds that they've cracked open so that then the poison comes out when they drink it in the tea and all that stuff. 
Um, the berry, ironically, just to make so that life is even more difficult, is technically edible. So have fun right next to that death trap, you know? There's a castor bean as well. <clears throat> yeah, castor has some fun stuff. Pull out the riceness uh, part of the oil and you use it for medicine, but you leave it in and it's bad, yeah. Um, squirrel on the undertone there. Coming back to yew tree. <laughs> Um, so yew tree, single needle, um, and it's flat and wide rather than flat and narrow, and it's single and there's no fascicle, and frankly, if you're familiar with pines at all, you'll look at it and all the yew tree, you can, you can look up a picture online and you'll see that it's like, I mean, I guess I could see how someone would confuse it, but not really. I wanted to know what it looked like, so, so I actually looked up these. Thank you, so we'll, oh, yeah. we'll take this around. It's very festive looking. Oh, yeah. You know? So it's the right up there. So that's the yew tree. Oh. Yeah, it looks different enough that you're not really gonna have a hard time. But it's good to know about, just so you're not like, oh, it's a funny looking pine. You know, as soon as you know that it's Judging from the picture, it's more I think like I've ever seen spruce like needles. Yeah, 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 they're shorter shorter. needles. Yep, they are also shorter, but there are some pines that have very short needles. Mm -hmm. So that's not a guarantee. Um <clears throat> Let's see, there is another look-alike, the cypress, or true cedars. They look like they have been, honestly, they look something like this, except flattened into two dimensions. So if you look at this, and then just imagine it flattened and it kind of bulgy along each of the things, that's more like what a cypress is, or a true cedar. Junipers are often called cedars because they look somewhat similar. And we'll get into that. As a matter of fact, maybe we should go there now. Any other questions about the pine tree, now that we've hit lookalikes? Anyone want to remind me, how do we tell a pine tree apart from his lookalikes? The fascicle. The fascicle. The fascicle. Yes. The fascicle and two to five on the needles. Nice. All right. Next, we have the juniper tree. Anyone want to quickly give me a time? I don't want to hold people past what I said, which I probably will anyway. 11, 12. 11, 12. All right, well, I, I don't know why, but I always go longer in this building. I don't, I've never gone over. Uh, that's, that's not true. That's because none of our clocks work. As you say, that clock is in the same time. <laughs> All right, well, I won't hold you guys too much longer, and I won't be offended if anybody needs to go ahead and exit, but I, I, uh, I followed too many squirrels today, so we're 10 minutes over, but juniper really quickly this guy was used by the native pueblo indian tribe actually as kind of their cure-all um it was used they used it uh, they took the juniper berries and probably some sprigs as well if i understand and they would have it in a pouch and that's the one thing that they would carry with them the medicine men and women of the of the pueblo tribe did. that's the one thing they would keep with them no matter where they went everything else they could find on site this they would take and I believe that they used it as an incense or an aromatherapy to uplift and counter the uh, impure spirits of, you know, sickness. Is impure. They would call it purification um, in their tribal uh, tradition. And so that's how Pueblo Indians would use it. There were some other tribes that used it in other ways. Um, this is one that uh, has a lot of lookalikes, and this mm -hmm. is one that has enough lookalikes that are, so there are dozens, scores of different kinds of juniper. Some of them are useful. Some of them are toxic. <clears throat> I am not going to be teaching you today how to tell them apart. This is more informational. Um, it's a little bit technical, but I've had enough people say, tell me about juniper, that I'm gonna tell you some things about juniper again. I don't recommend you harvest this on your own without a professional. There are some things that make it just hard to tell apart. I would be using words like stomata. Um, and that's the easy one. So... She's in horticulture right now. Yeah, in horticulture. All right. I snuck so many classes that were not in my major that were horticulture. That's how you do it. It took me six years to get my undergraduate degree because I kept sneaking classes that weren't on my major. Anyway, um, <laughs> a juniper um, in today's medicine, often the juniper, actually, no, there's one other fun thing. <sighs> yeah, all right. There's one other fun thing back in the medieval, medieval ages. Juniper berries, they're actually cones. They just look like berries. Um, they're fleshy cones. Those are coated in a yeast. 
and it's useful for sourdough starters, and, and uh, you might have heard of something called gin. Well, they figured out how to make that back in the Middle Ages, and then there was a problem. It was cheap, and there was a street called Gin Street in, uh, oh, I forget exactly which prominent city, whatever city it was. It was like London or something you would have heard of, but it was probably not London. It was some other famous... There was a... Okay, there we go. We'll say it was definitely London. All right. But um, there were gin streets all over besides just one city. But in one city, it was so bad that everyone, now there was cheap gin, which probably started as medicine, because this can be used for medicine when done correctly. Everybody uh, was rather unruly, and there were like riots and everything. And finally, they actually made a law where gin was regulated. And it was like the 1920s all over again, except the first time. Um, the prohibition happened in medieval <laughs> Europe um, because having all of that, uh, the, the yeast on the outside of the, the uh, juniper berries made it very easy, along with the juniper itself, for a nice flavored medicinal drink that was over-imbibed. And uh, eventually they had to regulate it, and then there was a big riot. Because they're like, give us our gin back! <laughs> and so there was a really big problem. So Juniper was in the center of all that debacle. You can read the history books for more detail, but it's just like, hmm, interesting. Um, but what they were probably trying to do with it when they made the gin is this is a very good diuretic, mm -hmm. meaning it helps you urinate. And if you have a urinary tract infection, that's not fun. And you want to get rid of it. And so this can help. Um, and then... Again, if you have kidney stones, this might, I don't know if this one's indicated for kidney stones, but diuretics in general usually help because then you have more of the kidney stone formation crystals being flushed out. Um, a few plants are diuretics and actually don't help that. I don't know about this one in particular, but in general, there's a fun thing about diuretics. Um, junipers, their wood is also, actually the entire tree is highly prized by bonsai um, crafters because junipers they have this stripped away looking bark where it just looks they look old before their time but in a majestic kind of way if you take if you pause and take time to actually look at it it's like actually yeah that looks awesome and so they make really excellent bonsai trees and then the scent coming off they're very aromatic like their cousins the true cedars these were probably called cedars not just because of the uh, Leaves, these are modified leaves, by the way. Um, not just because the leaves look similar, but also because they're both scented. And that uplifting scent, the Pueblo Indians and others believed was, was uh, beneficial, and frankly, that is probably true. Um, exactly how and exactly how much, that's another discussion. And if you're allergic, then bless you, they're around here. Um, but uh, the juniper that we would use in medicine for the diuretic and all that is called Juniperus communis. And so if you want to go and find out more, that is the one that you would go ahead and research on. It is very common. I haven't seen one in this area, but I'm positive that they grow here. Um, last thing I'll tell you about junipers is a little bit about identification, not between each juniper, because that's technical, again, so don't use these until you get that somewhere. But I will tell you how to tell a juniper from something else. If you take a look, there's a lot of ridges along each of the needles, or fronds, or whatever you want to call them. They're scaly, kind of like fish scales. They overlap each other. When a juniper is young, it puts out one needle, and it's a normal looking needle. There's no scales. Then, as it gets older, another needle grows from the first needle and splits it. And then from that needle, another needle. And they keep doing that and splitting and splitting and splitting as a new needle comes up. And the new needle doesn't get very far. He's very scaly. And so the mature ones are scaly because there's constantly a new needle coming up. But at the very beginning when they're young, they just have a single needle. So that scaliness is something that's seen in junipers. They're also three-dimensional in, it's coming off all sides, cedars are more flat and two-dimensional, but they also have scaly. 
So, um, here's for future you. Maybe you can see it. Maybe this will help better. There we go. So, <clears throat> there is a fun thing about Juniperus communis. This is not the full way to identify it, but this is the step one. It never matures its needles. It's one of the very few junipers. There are some other ones, unfortunately, that do uh, look alike and are still toxic, so this is not enough on its own. But to get you started, because you're here, I assume you're interested in plants. So I'll tell you. It never has that scaling. It just makes a single needle. And Juniperus communis is one of the few that do that. And so scaling is almost all junipers. But Juniperus communis uh, doesn't ever have adult leaves or needles or fronds. So the berries are, uh, yeah, they're dusted with that white stuff we talked about the yeast. So I'll go ahead and close with that um, on the three plants. Any questions about these guys? All right. Well, in that case, um, part three, I guess I'll let you know a couple events that are coming up first. Thank you guys for coming. Um, it's much funner talking to you guys than talking to myself. So, um, although I am a pretty good conversation partner when I'm you know, looking in the mirror, but um, squirrel on track. So there's uh, a number of fun herbal events that we like to offer in the area along with i do have a clinic up in jay i am a practicing alternative doctor um, i'm not a primary care doctor but you um at least not in this state um, but if you're interested in natural care i definitely can facilitate that i have business cards that are right over there there are also herbal education events this is monthly so um it's the first saturday at 10 a.m right here hope to see you back Glad to see you again. And then there's also, um, I do a herbal workshop once a month. Those are at different locations. I have ones up in J are probably the ones that you guys would be interested in. They're closest. I speak at like seven different locations, so I have to think about where I'm talking. Um, and this month, I am doing an herbal workshop on chronic inflammation. Um, it's kind of rampant in America. Inflammation is a problem. It affects, you know, brain fog, energy, being able to sleep, joint pain, stomach pain, all, you know, it affects lots of things. And so we're talking about a deep dive focusing on chronic inflammation. Other months, we might make an ointment. We made a super inside out skin salve last month that was technically an ointment with local plants. So we do things like that every month. Be sure to check up. Um, those ones do cost money, materials and whatnot. Um, and because they do not always have materials, but, um, those are monthly. Last event to let you guys know about is I am giving a eight session or one session a month for eight months, Foundations of Herbalism course. And that's for people who are interested in becoming herbalists in the home and then maybe eventually professionally. This is all the foundations of what you need to think like an herbalist besides just a reliable source saying this is good for pain that's great first step but what kind of pain when do you use it what do you mix it with what are the safety concerns how long do you use it what's the dose and all of those things are things that will hit in the foundations of herbalism course so if you're interested in that uh, let me know it starts in February and uh, those are kind of what I have for some cool events there are some other stuff but you have a newsletter in front of you to go ahead and look at the rest so I'll go ahead and release you from your captive state Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. That's great.